Welcome back to Mortuary Mayhem, a podcast by funeral service professionals for funeral service professionals, where any day above ground is a good one. And I think it's always like we never you're never serving at a funeral home the demographic that is being buried. You're serving the demographic that's going to bury them. So like, yes. you know, we're looking at I mean, my parents, unfortunately, knock on wood. I mean, they are getting older. All of our parents were at that age. But, you know, it's it's us that would be making that we're decision. We're the client. It's not it, the deceased. It's, we're the client. Right, exactly. Yeah. We're the client. So I think also, and I mean, I hear, and I'm sure you hear the same thing. I get commentary all the time. Well, I'll post a video on, you know, online and people go, what the hell? The college is going to hell. You know, what are these people doing? Why would they do this? And I think you're right. Like when we were students and we were saying earlier is when we were students, it was a whole different demographic than we have today. Now, maybe that is because we're in the two of us are in charge and people are seeing that and they're like, wow, that's cool. These guys are awesome. I want to be part of that. And we are getting a demographic that maybe we didn't get. I think we're also getting higher numbers. If you look at the numbers, there's, it's not that we're losing that prior demographic of student it's that we're adding on to that prior Absolutely. and we have more sure. students. So the people we didn't serve before or the people that are predecessors, I may have some names there, our predecessors you know, when they came into, when these students came into the classroom, they told them, you need to change and you need to change today. You're never going to have a job. And I didn't tell them, and I know you're not telling them the same thing. Yeah. I'm saying, hey, look, get the job. And then what you do once you have the job is different, yeah. <laughs> but get totally. the job. And yeah. I think that's, I think, I think we are serving that demographic. And I think you're right. It's out of the funeral homes, we are starting to take over, but I think the challenge that we're still facing or the challenge that these students are going to face as they get out into the workplace is the 90 year old guy is still in the chair when you enter and he's still running the place, even though he doesn't do it the day to day, his name is on the sign still, he's still doing it. And that's, you know, that that's always going to pose a challenge. Um, unfortunately, sure. unless you get up one where, yes, you do have that 40 year old that's running the place. They took over. We're at that age where we're taking over grandpa's and dad's business, you know, <laughs> Dads are in their and dad are still stopping by every day and bothering everybody for another 10 or 20 years. And that's true. But, you know, in different parts of the country, there's parts of the country that even even the younger people are still very conservative and it'll always be that way. There's always going to be different different kinds of people in different kinds of funeral homes, I, I think. But I think that we have passed the point of no return where we have to examine how we how we do things in funeral service. And I think this generation is ready to do it differently. Where, where we were still afraid of something. I know, I'm not sure what. I think it was, maybe it was just the time in, in history, the economy. I don't know. I don't know all the reasons. That's somebody else's job to study that. But um, I think we saw it. And we saw how it was affecting everything. And we didn't like it. And so now we're going to gonna allow the changes, you know, as we age, um, which, which is really cool. But yeah, I mean... It, it doesn't even, even, you know, I, I'm probably one of the more progressive program leaders. There's no doubt of that, but still I do tell the students, you have to start somewhere. If that means you have to put on a suit and pantyhose for six months or a year to have a job on your resume that you can then use to get a, one that fits you better, suck it up for that time. I mean, it, that we have to do those things. I've had to do jobs. I didn't love to get better ones and to, to do that. And, and so we do, you know, we're, we're not out here telling students, fuck everybody, do whatever you want, be crazy. We're not saying that guys that, that always come at, at program directors for, for things. That's not what's going on in schools at all. We're very realistic with them about the fact that, Hey, you know, your first job, the likelihood you're still going to be there and, you know, uh, a, a couple of years is nearly zero. And, uh, you know, you, you got to get what you can get out of it to get to somewhere that's a better fit for you. And that's just the cycle of employment in every industry. You got to start somewhere, right? And sometimes you got to work somewhere you don't like and wear an, a uniform you don't like and to get somewhere you do. And, you know, where I think we're very honest with them about that. Well, and like Dan was saying earlier, he, you guys provide a comfort to us as students. Like I know I, I only recently graduated and having Dan as a professor really did mean a lot to me as a person. And many of the other students that attend here, they'll come right up and say it and be like, Dan's awesome. I really feel comfortable enough to have a conversation with him, mm -hmm. to tell him things about myself and I'm not gonna get judged about it. You can walk up to Dan and be like, hey, I'm queer and I'm afraid about getting a job at a funeral home. What do I do? And Dan will be like, well, let's sit down and talk about yeah. it. Of course I'd be here to 
for you. Like you guys are so crucial. Um, and thank you, especially from my perspective as a, a recent graduate. Uh, I know I've never had you as a, a professor before Faith, but I can, I get the same exact energy from you that you guys are just so easy and comfortable and understanding and you're willing to listen. And even it doesn't necessarily matter that when you were my age that you didn't know what to do and how to change things what matters is that you wanted to and yeah. that you're willing to now it means a lot to to the to the younger folks so thank yeah you. I hear that from my students well how will you have how did you they I don't know what they think they think I I don't know what they think I am but they're wrong and they're, they're how do well, you have tattoos you have this or that I'm like I didn't I wasn't born this way I didn't look like this in 2003 when I started working in funeral homes, you know what I mean? Like I, I can look like this now because of the 20 years I've put in and the, the reputation I've built day one faith wasn't this, you know what I mean? And, and so remembering that I think is, is important for students to hear too, you know, it, you don't, and I think a lot of, a lot of younger people for, for whatever reason, um, again, I, I just keep going back to COVID and, and that, cause that's, that's kind of the most obvious thing. And I, I think any young person doesn't recognize this about generations older than them. They didn't start where they are now, right? So you you go into a job or you go into a school and you see your your program chair that looks like me that that looks like I look like a gym teacher. It's how I dress most days, and you know all that kind of thing. And and they think, oh well, I well see you don't have to you don't have to wear suits. You can have tattoos. You can have colored hair. After twenty years of of earning the reputation, maybe. Yeah, because now people know when I talk, I'm that I that I have the education, the experience, and and that I, you know, I'm not just some pretender or, or something. I don't know, you know what I mean. But you have to take that time and build the reputation that you have, where you can do other things. You you, you can't come out of mortuary school and think, well, I'm just gonna, I should be able to look like this because my my professor has tattoos, so it's, so it's okay. I. It is okay in a lot of places. It's also not in a lot of places. So you have to navigate that. I still, there's still funeral homes that wouldn't hire me. And that's fine. I wouldn't want to work for them. There's still funeral homes. If my friend calls and says, hey, can you cover a service for me? He's got a traditional place. He's a suit wearing guy. I'm going to wear the clothes. I'm going to do it out of respect for his business, you know? Um, but I've earned the right to look like this in a way, just by building that that career and reputation. And it didn't start day one. So no, I'm not telling you, you can just roll into a funeral home with blue hair and your forked tongue and all that stuff. And everybody just has to accept it. You you have to have, you gotta have the, you gotta put your, your what is it? What's the, what's the idiom? You have to uh, put your money where your mouth is or something. You gotta be able to yeah, back so. up with, with something, you know, that, and, and it takes time to, to have that. You gotta, you gotta grow as a professional first. Yeah. And I think Shauna wrote our dear, dear friend, Shauna wrote about, um, said it well too, is, you know, she told me, you know, same thing. She's got the tattoo, she's got mm -hmm. the piercings, all that. And she said, what the students need to know, what the people in the profession need to know, but what these students need to know is that there's a difference between value and appearance. And yes. when you reach a certain point, you have value. But you can't look like this if you don't have value. You can't walk in and say, well, you have tattoos. Why can't I have them? Because you don't have value yet. But when I come in and the family sees me and they say, you've been serving me every single day. And over the last 20 years, I watched you get a tattoo, piercings, and all of that. But you buried my grandmother 20 years ago. You buried my mother 10 years ago. And today, you're going to bury my brother. But I'm not worried about your tattoos. I'm not worried about your piercings because I know you and you're the best funeral director sure. that ever ran the funeral. And she she said it well with, you know, again, it's you've shown your value. Now you've proven yourself. But yes. here I am today. I didn't start this way. Uh, take out your tattoo. You know, sorry, cover your tattoo. No, take them out. <laughs> cover your <laughs> cover your tattoos. Uh, take out your piercings for that interview. Get through. I have a beard for those that, you know, can't see me. I know my image is all out on the internet too. But, you know, when I went for the, my first interview at a funeral home, I actually shave my beard off. Nobody, I, I can't either. Um, <laughs> nobody, I look like a turtle. Nobody, <laughs> nobody knew what I looked like. Nobody had ever seen me without facial hair. I've had facial hair since I was a junior in high school. Yeah. Okay, nobody knew what I looked like. Yeah. And all of a sudden, everyone was like astounded. But you know what? I grew it out. I got value. I grew back just the front. I didn't yeah. have the sides anymore, but I grew out the, I had the front. Um, I kept it real. Right now it's bushy, but you know, I kept it really short. It was always close to my face for the entire time that I worked. And then in the day I 
uh, the day I stopped working at the funeral home was the last day I shaved the sides again. And I grew those sides out. It got a little bushy. Um, my brother's in Alaska, so I had to go visit him. That was my excuse that I had to, you know, sustain the yeah. cold. But but that was my value. And in a 22, you were saying about different jobs, like, you know, again, at our age. Um, but, you know, you we work different jobs than people do now. And same thing, my brother um, had worked um uh, you know, worked at the same first job I had. We worked, we cared for goats and cleaned trailers in an RV dealership. Okay, we were rental trailers. We cleaned them. We, I mean, it was nasty. Then my brother in college, um, he got a job with um, some cleaning company, professional cleaning company. He was cleaning a, I think it was energy or battery, but he was cleaning their factory. Uh, that was his job after classes. It was great. But my brother was a nuclear med tech. He works at a hospital. He's actually the head of his department, at nuclear medicine, has been for years. But he was looking for a job and nobody could hire him. They couldn't find a job. And all of a sudden, this hospital in Alaska um, gave him a call and said, we want you. All right. So he he had 18 days to drive to Alaska. If those doing the math were on the East Coast, it takes nine days. If you don't sleep, if you don't stop, you drive the speed limit straight across. It takes nine days to drive there. He drove there, I think, in like 16 or 17 days. He had 18 to get there. Oh, no, we took two days in the beginning to get GPS and better boots and better jacket. Oh, my then, gosh. Then he drove, I think, for like 11 or 12 days. And then he arrived the day before orientation. So and he drove through. He stopped you know, along the way uh, to sleep very briefly and then yeah. something in his car and drove. So when he gets out there, now, after all of that last minute job, he gets out there. And the person tells him, said, you know why we gave you the job? He goes, no. He goes, why did you hire me? He goes, we hired you because you were a janitor. Huh. And he goes, excuse me? He goes, we hired you because you cleaned trailers, you cared for goats, and you were a janitor. And he goes, what does that have anything to do with nuclear medicine? And it's like all these people that their first job is like, yeah, I want to be a funeral director. I'm going to work in a funeral home. I'm going to work. Yeah. But where's your value? Because they said- your value was, he goes, we're looking at all these people and their first jobs were working for hospitals, working all these things. They're in healthcare. That's great. He goes, we're glad that they know how to do their job and they have experience. And they got that five years experience that was required on the on the application. It's the five years experience. He goes, how do you get five years experience? He goes, you can't get that unless we give it to you. He says, but we hired you because you knew how to do the grunge work, which we knew that you were going to be the person that no matter what it took was going to work hard. And you weren't mm-hmm. going to give up. There's value. That's value right there. Oh, yeah. No, a- absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the things we hear all the time as, as educators, at least I do about, you know, the, and, and I, look, I talk about it too. The students are different. They are, they are different now and they're going to be different in 10 years. And they're going to be different 10 years later. And, and that's, and that's just how the world works. Um, but, you know, this work-life balance thing that we talk about so much in funeral directing um, everybody's like, well, how do you, how do you make it that, you know, how do you fix that? Well, you don't, and you have to understand that that looks different. And so student, you know, students need to understand that employers need to understand that, that, that value that a person brings, they still need to bring, bring value, but it may look different than what it looked like 20 years ago. Right. So a student's experience or life experience or, you know, job experience may look different than what you would have expected 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and, and we have to, we have to do more now as employers or, or preceptors or whatever, you know, than, than we've had to do in the past. We, we kind of got people that, that already, you know, kind of knew a little bit what they were getting into. And now that's not always the case. And they, they don't have like, kind of like those life skills, like we talked about, cause they hadn't had real jobs before, I guess you could say, or difficult, difficult jobs, you know, like we did you know, generations ago. Um, But that doesn't mean they're value less. We just have to look for value somewhere else than, than we may have been used to looking, you know, before. So it's, it's really, there's work on both ends, you know, to be done. Students need to get acquainted real quick with a job that's in person every day that, that, starts on time every day and that, you know, you never know what your day is going to be day to day. That's the nature. We can't change what funeral service is. So we can, can change how we schedule people. Maybe we can, you know, change how we structure our, our business in, in a way that's a more, that's a better schedule, but we can't change the very nature of somebody's got to go get grandma at 2am. Somebody's got to do it. 
Somebody's got to do the service Saturday morning, even if they worked Friday. I mean, that's just the nature of the business. We can't change what the business is. Um, so we just kind of have to change how we, you know, how we think about, about what, what it looks like. And, and that means when we're looking at student applicants or preceptorships or new grads or this or that, we have to, to shift our perspective a little bit and, and go, okay, maybe they didn't work in a funeral home for the past four years doing transfers and prep stuff and, and this like, like they had been, you know, years in the past for whatever reason, but they has, they still have value in some other way. We just have to be willing to find that maybe in a way that looks differently than, than it did before. Maybe they have tech skills. I have my eight-year-old made a TikTok yesterday for me because I don't know how to do it. No, really she did. You know, she can't do any hard labor. To be honest about that, but I can't make a TikTok. So there's her value for yesterday. You know, she wasn't out there scrubbing floors. She does, she does clean at the shop. Um, but she did something valuable for her mother. You know what I mean? So kind of the same thing. We have to, we might have to just shift what we're, what that value looks like to us um, as we, we move forward in our, in our industry. Yeah. I mean, the industry, it definitely is. I think the change is always hard, you know, for any industry. And I think ours is really hard. Um, I, I remember the protest when we switched to uh, electronic death record system and they were not having it. What do you mean? I don't care. Use my typewriter. I mean, Come on, a typewriter in 2014. Come on, <laughs> they couldn't even find the ribbon. You, how, how do you, you know where you could even buy that? But, uh, but I do remember that. And I think oh, yeah. part of that is that our today, the demographic of people we're serving, it's not that I think, yes, all right, there are some people that don't want to work, and I get that. But I think it's also when these funeral homes started, they were mom and pop shops. Yes. And your, it was a patriarchal society. Uh, very much so. But it was also a society where, yes, if you were a family, one of you could go do the removal, one of you could do that, and one of you could, because you were coordinating, one of you could watch the kids, the phone yep. rang, now it's your cell phone, but your phone rang in your house, yep. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to say the wife that was watching the kids could pick up the phone, they could answer yep. that, and they could designate that. Uh, so that society has changed that we have so many students. It's not that they don't want to work. I think some of them don't, but they're not from funeral families. That's they're not sure. from funeral families. Right. So when they go home, they have a, they have a wife and kids and a husband and, you know, most of them it's, you know, we have a very heavy female demographic, but in our schools. So, but a lot of them are going home to a family that's already established they're older students. They're not, these are not ones that are starting out and trying to figure out their life together as a yeah. couple. They're going and they already have a significant other. And mm -hmm. now they need to figure out, hey, you work the overnight shift. I was watching the kids during the day. You were watching the kid or whatever the flip, flip, yeah. flop that, you know, yeah, you're a nurse and you work the overnight shift. And <clears throat> I would, you know, put the kids to bed. Now I got overnight removals. Who's going to watch these kids? They can't right. watch themselves. Yeah, we don't have the we don't have this the society su family support that we did in generations past in a lot of different ways. Um, and that's you know one of the good things I think about online education that people that that don't like online education. What they're missing is that is that the world has changed. I couldn't go to mortuary school in whatever year this is. What year are we in? Twenty twenty four. I couldn't go to mortuary school now. I could not do it if I had to go in person. It would be impossible for me um, because in a lot, of, I, I I did an article with some oh, Fortune magazine, I don't know, something like that a couple months ago about, and it really, here's something that drives me nuts. I'm going to pop off for about five minutes and then I'll, I'll give you, let you get on with your day. You can edit, edit me, edit me out however you want to. But like when I hear women are the future of funeral service, uh-uh, women are the present. We've been here. Mortuary schools have been predominantly female since 2002, right? Like, this isn't new, okay? The reason isn't that women have some new interest in this. The reason is that now they can because they can go to school online in a lot of places, right? Or they can do prerequisites on whatever the school the the school modalities have changed in a way that make it more accessible to to women specifically because even in 2024 women are still expected to be the default parent the default homemaker the default everything so you know you have a man and he has a job and that's cool and he maybe he'll help 
with the kids. Maybe he'll help with the home duties, but it's still in most family structures, it's still at this day and age, those tasks fall predominantly on, you know, the female in the relationship. And so if I have to work full time, so does my husband, but I also have to be the main manager of the home and the children as well. And now how am I supposed to go to school? You know, so it has, um, and it, the, the days of a one income household are, are almost gone. You can't live in many, many places on one income. So both, you know, partners have to work regardless if it's male, female, male, male, whatever it is. So, but so you have two work full-time working people usually in a household, then you add kids and a business and all those things. And those other duties still heavily fall on the female or, you know, one of the two people more than the other. It's never 50, 50. Um, so having the ability to go, to go, um, to school online makes it more possible for women because those other duties almost always fall to the female in the relationship. Um, and if it's a female, female relationship, it still is going to fall to one person more than the other. So, um, you know, it, it's not that women now have this interest in, in funeral service that we didn't have before. It's that they can go to school now in a modality where they, maybe don't have to worry about finding childcare because their husband works these hours and this and, and this or that. So it may, it's just become more accessible to women. That's it. We haven't, haven't gotten more interested, just been become more accessible, but that drives me crazy. Women are coming into funeral service in record numbers. That's been the case for two decades. Where are you? Yeah, what do you and, mean? Yeah. You women know? were the, I mean, if you look back in history, women were the first ones to care yes. for the dead historically, but I mean, even today, like, I mean, before I, now my classroom is half Zoom, half in person at the same time, mm -hmm. synchronously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's, it is it's rough. And, but, you know, now I haven't had a kid in my classroom for, for a while because they stay on Zoom if that's the case. But I mean, I remember pre-COVID, um, you know, we're just, I mean, I worked with Zoom. Um, I mean, I was always that professor. What do you mean you have surgery? Well, I can't come to your class. I have surgery. Okay. So what time is the surgery? Three o'clock. Okay. What time are you being in recovery? Four. Okay. So my class starts at four thirty. So I expect you to be in class. And they look and they go, What? And I said, This is before people knew about Zoom, really. And I said, Well, you got FaceTime, Skype, Zoom. I'll show you how to use it. They're like, mm -hmm. What? I said, Do you have friends? They went, Yeah, okay. I said, So I expect a computer in my classroom in the front desk and they continue it. And it's I was joking. I was entirely joking. When I walk in the classroom, I'm like, What's the computer facing the other way for? They're like, Oh, that's so and so. The student actually was in recovery, morphined up, laptop on her lap in recovery, and she was in my class. And I was like, you know what? This is awesome. I commend that. Yeah. But the other thing was I had students, same thing, that they're, you know, the kid missed the bus and things like that. And I was like, yeah. and they were like, hey, my kid missed the bus. I have to get to class. I'm like, okay, so bring the kid. Yeah. And they're like, I can do that. I watched, I remember before that, I watched some of these people's kids. I still look at them on Facebook and things like that. And I'm like, wow, this kid's like 13. Wow. I watched this kid grow up. Like yeah. I actually watched this kid. I There was one kid I actually, um, and hopefully the mother's listening. She'll get a crack out of this. But, you know, the mother had to take her final exam. And when Mount Ida was closing, I had to go to the closure meetings. And all of a sudden she was like, Hey, professor, could you watch my kid for me again today? I was like, yeah, what time? She goes, my files are this. I'm like, oh, I got a meeting. I said, but as long as your kid can come to the meeting with me, I brought this kid to the closure meetings for the college. Oh, shit. It was awesome. But you know what? It was great. I gave this kid coloring books and things. I used yeah. to give her, I used to give her, um, I always thought it was funny, but they, she needed a note to get out of school. Like, so she could let her teacher know. So I was like, I can do better. I'll give you a certificate. I attended Professor Shea's lecture on oh and my every gosh. day. No, the funny thing is, these kids, anytime we had a kid in the classroom, they never showed up for like the cardiovascular system or something. It was always the urinary or reproductive oh chapters every oh single semester. And I'd be like, gosh. hey, you know, um, you know what chapter this is, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, so you might want your kid to sit in the hallway or face the other way. Ah, no, my kid knows this stuff. I'm like, perfect. And they right? would, they'd have this kid facing it. I'm like, by the way, my slides are not cartoons. When I show something, I really show it on the slide. Jess is nodding her head. She knows, <laughs> she knows, but it's, you know, I said, when I show you something, I show the real thing. And they're like, oh, perfectly fine. I'm like, okay, I'm cool with that. As long awesome. as you are. Yeah. But think about how many people 
that would be the difference. Like literally that's the difference for them. And there's, you know, there's plenty of programs that don't have online options. And then I, I personally preferred person teaching. I prefer teaching in person and I prefer going to school in person. Um, however, you know, we, we have had to adapt to our, our clientele essentially as, as educators. And it, it's opened it up to a lot more students that would not have the ability to do a program, you know, mortuary program because they they cannot come to a classroom for however many hours a day, four to five days a week, just because they have all these other responsibilities. Um, and what they don't have anymore is, you know, family support. There's not a, there's not an abuela at everybody's home, you know, going to watch their kids for free. You're gonna have to pay somebody $30. And if I want a babysitter, it's $30 an hour here. Forget it. She can sit in the car. You know what I mean? It's like, but <laughs> you know, she's old enough now. She doesn't, you know, her brother told them that they can stay together for a while, but it's like, there were times when there would be no way in heck. Like if I had to go back to in-person college today, I could not do it. It would be impossible. So I'm no, it's, 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 those people. No, it's too hard. And again, as you said, daycare is astronomical. And, stuff. Yeah. and I'm always welcome. I always told people, I'm like, hey, you want to, you know, this is going to be the issue. I said, yeah, just bring your kids. They're like, they're destructive. I'm like, all right, so keep them away from the sharp tools. But other than that, I'll give them a ball of wax and I'll give them a head. They can have fun. Oh, totally. She loves, she loves doing that on the heads. I just gave her that and she'll fart around forever on that. But, you know, I, I mean, and then, you know, what you hear is, well, how are they going to get a job if they can't go to school in person? Because I, I, what did I say? How are they going to go if they can't come to school in the snow? How are they going to go to the funeral home? I said it myself. But, you know, going to school online, knowing that the job isn't online, I think people know that. And I think that that gives them time to, you know, set their life up in a way that they can can make those arrangements. Maybe, you know, if I start a program that's two years long and my kid is six by the time they're two, four, whatever, by the time it ends they're in school, you know, so people, they, they can plan ahead that far, you know, to do that. But yeah, the online thing, a lot of, a lot of people think that you can't get a good education online. And I, I think that's wrong. I think, I think it's up to the individual. Oh, I think it's long cough. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's a great, um, I think in person is better. I, I think the in person's a that. lot. I, yeah. I, I think, think the in person's a lot better. And I think, but I think as long as the practical components are taken seriously, yep. you know, this is not your time to cut corners. This is not your time. If you take the education seriously and you take advantage of all those practical act activities and you do those, I think it's great. I think I've never had an issue with um, with a student that had a kid in the background and they're playing with the kid. I mean, I when again, as I said, when the kids used to come to the classroom, I used to play with Tonka trucks on the front of the classroom while lecturing. I can talk and do anything at the same time. I can talk and I can just talk. But, you know, I can, I can, um, you know, play with Tonka trucks on the front of the classroom with these kids. I've kicked strollers back and forth. I've, I've swaddled kids, you know, infants in my arms yeah. while I talked just so the parent could take notes. I'm like, no, you leave your kid because I need to take notes and stop. Leave your kid alone. I'll take care of your kid. I can talk. I know the material. I'll talk and I'll do this at the same time. But I've never had an issue with somebody with the kids. Um, the issue is that if I've had is because they're at work and they're trying to take class from work and they're doing work and they're not doing class. They just have us in the background. And I'm like, no, you're not actually yeah, in my that, classroom. That's definitely, a th that's, that's a thing, which sucks. And again, you know, that kind of goes back to everything's remote now and people just expect that. I hate lecturing to a bunch of black screens. It makes me crazy. Um, and, but, but for me, you know, I, I prefer to teach in person. I'm only teaching in person this semester. I don't like doing the online stuff, but it's a big part of our program. Um, and, I can honestly tell you that for every student that kind of, you know, is kind of a, a screw off with it, there's two that aren't. And so those are, those are some of my favorite students, honestly, those like, you know, young moms or middle-aged moms even that are trying to do this and it's important to them, but they have all these other things. Those I find are often the most invested and engaged students um, because it means so much to them to be able to go back to school. And I have, you know, I have students in their 60s. They were never got to go to college because of they had to raise kids. They had to do all this stuff. And, you know, they're so proud of the ability that that they're going to college now for this this mortuary science degree that even if they've got or, you know, in their 40s, 30s, you know, they, they never got to do it before that they will, you know, even if they had to turn their camera off to change a diaper or to, you know, listen to a lecture on their Zoom, you know, Bluetooth while they're driving somewhere, 
they're willing to do that because it's so meaningful to them to have the opportunity that they couldn't have had before online stuff. So yeah, it's not ideal. I do think people learn better in person. I teach better in person, 100%. But I think that we're getting people into the industry that have the heart for it. They have the brain for it. They never had the opportunity for it now that deserve to be there and are going to get to be there because of online modalities. I yeah. know I personally, I've always been a better learner online. Um, I went on, went to college uh, uh, right out of high school a decade ago, and I didn't stop. I really like going to school. I, I only have this school. one. I'm 40. I'm so I only have this one degree, but I really like going to college, so I, yeah. I still go because it's fun for me. But I found that virtual learning worked best for me for for mm -hmm. one reason or another. Mostly attentiveness issues on my part. When I'm in sure. my own room, I'm not distracted by my own deck decorations but god forbid somebody sneezes and you've lost me and, but I know that as an online student I also expected my work to be harder I also mm -hmm. I expected there to be more pressure on me because I thought yeah. well I'm an online student so I'm, I'm kind of teaching myself especially if it's a, a professor that doesn't lecture like yeah. if there is no set meeting time and I'm just getting assignments then if I want an education, I have to read the book. I have to read the yeah. book and I have to do the assignments and I have to send emails when I have questions and I have to try to learn. That's that's what you have to do when you want to yeah. learn something is you have to want it. Yeah, most of them do. I really think most of them do. And, and you know, they, they have life factors that don't allow to be in a classroom all week and that's fine. I've got, I think this semester I've got 14 in person, which is awesome. That's a full classroom for me. My classroom only seats 16 or something like that. I don't know. But um, that's great. And we're going to have, we're going to do a lot of things. You know, what, what I think they miss online is just those things that come up because somebody had a question and it's, oh, well, let me show you. Let's run over here and I'll show you this. You know what I mean? I can yank the casket out. I can pull the flag out. I can pull the whatever. I can say you two, you know, sit and pretend you're this person. We can just do things more, more on the fly in an in-person classroom than you can online, I think. Um, but I do feel like the online students for the most part are more disciplined because they have to be, or they won't get through it. So, yeah. Well, I think yeah. if they have to be more disciplined and if they're not right, as you said, they won't get through it. So it's like, yeah. I start off with this many and I end with this many. And I, I always have to answer that question to the college of like, why is your retention rate low? Well, because they didn't put the effort in. So if you put the effort in, you get to the end. But mm -hmm. yes, we have a lot of people that said, oh, good, because it's online, I can do this. Or because it's by Zoom, I can do this. And if you're and, you know, speaking to the audience, like if you're the student that says, oh, good, I can do this, it's going to be easy. You're not. It's not. No, be it's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be harder. It's going to be much harder. It's much easier to sit in a classroom because something's given to you. And when you have to have that time management, you have to push away distractions. You have to find a quiet place to study. You yeah. have to remember to tune in. You don't see your fellow classmates. You don't know who they are. You don't have those group studies. You don't walk by and don't have a model in the classroom. Like, hey, can you explain uh, that to me? Yeah. You have to be 10 times the student than an in-person would have had to be. Yeah. So if you're an online student, you ha expect yeah. to put in more work, you know, not less. Yeah, absolutely. We had that one student, um, graduated with us a year ago um that I tried to convince Dan to give her four-year-old a degree I was like that little girl was in class with her mom literally every day for every class sitting right next to her on the couch paying attention looking right at the screen I was like that little girl can somebody we get was her like, a degree somebody, too I, no I had somebody the year before she was like can my mom get a degree too because she's listened to all these lectures because I we I do it in my living room and she thinks it's so interesting I was like yeah bring her to the lab we'll see if she can embalm <laughs> but no I mean it's it's um yeah I mean it, it's it's really cool and and it's it really warms my heart those students that I I love all my students I think they're all special for their own reasons but but I will admit you know the ones that really make me give me the most satisfaction are those ones that are a little bit older maybe they haven't had the easiest life you know and going back to school or being able to go to college for the first time at you know middle aged is just they just cry when they graduate they're just so because they never thought they could have that and and it's possible for them now um, and it's so cool to see that. So um, one of my favorite students right now is an in-person student and, and she's in her 60s and she was a stay-at-home mom and she raised five boys and now she's doing something for her at 60 something. She's going to college and she's going to do this even if she only works for five years. So you know what I mean? And then decide she's going to retire. She's she's putting in the effort and she's 
she's so valuable in the class, honestly, because she cares. She's a great example of like being engaged. And, you know, she has all those life skills we talked about. She's always on time. She's always, you know, all of that, that stuff. But she, um, she always has some input, you know, that's valuable, you know, for the other students, because she has so much, you know, life experience, and it means so much to her that it kind of reminds those 19 year olds that, um, you know, this is a real job and people really care about this. And I think, I think having her in the class inspires the other people to give a little bit more of a shit than maybe they would if there wasn't somebody that wanted it so bad, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. I mean, when I went, when I went through mortuary school, it was my second out of three degrees, but it was my second degree. Um, and I did a couple things before that, but, um, I was running a company I was working two, three jobs in, um, you know, at the same time. So, I mean, I, I'm a hard worker, no question there, but I did it and I got through mortuary school full time, mortuary mm -hmm. school full time working three, you know, one yeah. job was full time. The other two were part time. Um, so I did pull it off and I always tell my students, I'm like, I know you can do this. I did it. I know you can do it. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is our non-traditional students that are going online. And as you said, it's not that they're not going to be able to work later like what are you gonna do you can't you can't direct funerals online you can't do yeah. this i think it's the fact that a lot of them are timing that out like hey look i i had kids those kids are now going to be school age yeah. um but i have to be in a degree for two years and at that point these kids are now going to be school age um i'm going to be an empty nester or mm -hmm. at that time my or you know now we're, we're talking about being in the 40s you know we have jobs fire police whatever where your spouse yeah. Uh, maybe having an early retirement in mm -hmm. their mid forties. So yeah. you're like, Hey, look, and then some of them are the same thing. They may be police officers. They're taking their, they're taking our classes from their cruiser because yeah. they reached the age of 40, what was it? 43. I think they retired 45, right? So yeah. like 43, they've reached, Hey, look, I do this for two years full time from my cruiser while I'm posted. And then I graduate, I retire the same day. Yeah. And I go on and work for the funeral home. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that there there's a balance that there's a timed out structure involved. Oh, yeah, in there's a, there's several retired military that have gone through our program and because and they just want to work in a funeral home part time. They're not looking to be a full time embalmer even, you know, and that's OK, too. But they want to want to get the education and they want to maybe they want to meet. Maybe they just want to work part time or, or, or whatever. And that's that's cool, too. But, yeah, there's just so many so much diversity in in students now um when i was in school we had we had some older students and i feel that i look back i'm like god those were the ones with all the highlighters taking all the notes and because they cared so much because it meant so much to them and then you know there's us idiots in the back hung over and all this stuff you know but but watching them made you want to try a little harder or want to you know care a little more because you saw how much it meant. And it was almost like, well, if I just sit here and don't pay attention, I'm kind of a jerk because, you know, and so I do think that, that having that difference in, you know, in people in the classroom can be, can keep others on track. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's what I said before you learn from your, you learn from your classmates, what, what you should yeah. or how you mm -hmm. should do it, you know, and on that note too, before we go, I want to give a shout out you and uh, Shauna are doing a, we are. Yeah. Shauna and I just started a YouTube series called the mom Titians because Shauna um, was called mom Titian by her students. My students call me the fairy goth mother, but we went with mom Titian, mom Titians. I don't like, I like, I think it's cute, but I'm also like, I'm really not goth. I'm really not. I mean, I'm wearing color. I don't know. I don't do any of that. I go to bed at eight o'clock. I'm very rocket. You are the most wonderful fairy goth mother. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. I'll take it. Um, so anyway, the show's called the mom Titians. It is for, um, students who are, or people who are considering mortuary school, people who are currently in mortuary school, people who've recently graduated from school or people that just want to listen, because I think a lot of y'all forgot some stuff. Um, along the way and it'll be it, I know I have I mean I when I started teaching I was like dang I forgot all about this <laughs> you know it happens over time it's just it just is um so it might be interesting to to relearn some stuff or or think about stuff you haven't thought about in a while but we're doing um it's it's a lecture series so we're going to have a topic each week we're going to start with green um embalming methods green burial is going to be our first topic we're going to drop that on the 24th of January so not this Wednesday but the following 
Um, and we're just going to go, we're, we're not really going to follow like the, the curriculum. It's, we are, we're going to be based off the mortuary science curriculum, but it's not going to be like our lectures that we give in class on a particular thing. It's going to be more like, we're going to talk about a specific thing each, each week in a kind of a, a lecture format. Um, and it's meant to be a supplement for students, um, to just maybe hear the same information, a little bit differently from you know from different people and hear their experiences and it, it helps reinforce some of those concepts but also show you why this stuff is important for you to learn like why does it matter if i know this well because this is how it translates to the real world am i going to be sitting there you know writing the i don't know am i going to be sitting there doing some task like i did in mortuary school no but that does that mean i'm not going to use that information also no and so here's, you know, it's kind of a, how, how does this stuff actually translate? How does the things you're learning in school or have learned in school act? Why does it actually matter other than, you know, passing a test or getting through school? Here's how all these things play out and you're going to have to draw back to these, you know, in, in your career as well. So that's our, that's our thing. Well, I certainly look forward to it and probably could have used you in my educational career because as Dan admitted, he talks a lot. No, not me. Not me at all. Not you. But it, we have the intro up on YouTube now. Um, and then the first like actual episode will be on the 24th. And then Carrie, Carrie the Mortician and I are doing a rewatch of the series Six Feet Under. So we're like six or seven episodes into that on YouTube and Spotify as well. We're just rewatching the show together and talking about it from the perspective of people who've actually lived it and talk about what's real, what's not, what's, you know, what kind of that kind of thing and we've got some guests that that come on that show too so yeah those are the those are the fun things i'm doing no that's ex yeah that's exciting i mean i had we actually in our department have the entire dvd series um i know we're going back to cds and dvds here but we have the entire dvd series i have vhs by the way in my department too but oh, we don't God. we don't have the player for it i know but we have the dvds for the entire series you have we have titanic we, on two vhs's <laughs> we do i actually do at home but <laughs> They had, um, but we had the whole DVD series, never watched it. So finally I saw it on YouTube and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that, um, you know, I worked with the living before I worked with the dead too. So for those that don't know that. So, I mean, I've always, and my father's the same way, um, you know, we're trying to watch these like medical shows uh, that everyone loves, the medical dramas they are on, you know, TV and everyone loves these. And me and my father, you don't want to watch them with us. You just don't, because we're like, oh, that's yeah, wrong, that's people. wrong. They would never do that over, or we're calling out the diagnosis before they come in the door. The patient's <laughs> getting wheeled in and me and my father are like, oh, that's something. My father's like, oh, that's something such. And I'm pointing out, I'm like, hey, the x-ray is backwards. This is right. Oh my and, God. Right. So I'm like, so I'm thinking going, you know, I don't want to watch Six Feet Under. It's about my profession. I'm going to get angry. I'm not going to like it because there's going to be so many things wrong. Um, and, you know, and yes, there were things I picked up on. But for the most part, I think that was a good show. I That's, do, too. And, it, it and I watched accurate. it the first time when it came out, you know, when it was really on TV. It's the first time I watched it. And I was like early, early 20s. And it really kind of kept me on the track to go to mortuary school, to be honest. And then when, you know, I didn't watch it again. And then years and years later, I decided I was going to rewatch. I'm like, oh God, I bet this is a terrible show. And I just thought it was good at the time. And I was like, oh shit, this really held up over time. And like so many of the things in the show that were just these crazy things have happened to me now. And I'm like, oh, yep, I've dropped somebody. Oh, yep, I've had somebody accuse us of stealing a, a ring. Oh God, oh yep, I've gone to the wrong, wrong, you know, all the stuff that happens that you're like, oh, that's for TV. Nope, it's real. It has really happened to somebody, I promise you. But yeah, we're rewatching it. We're just just kind of kind of and we say that a lot. I'm really continually surprised at how much research they really did on this. You know, some things are ridiculous or not realistic, but for the most part, I mean, as as much as they could do for for a TV show, I think they really did a good job and and the different kinds of families, the different kinds of, you know, um restorative art stuff. I think yeah, I think they did a good enough job. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not all of us talk to ghosts in our prep rooms, but I mean, we don't. But what if? But wouldn't it be nice if we could? That would be awesome if we had. If the decedent could actually tell us what they want, that would be. I so mean, if they fun. were a nice person, if they were a grump, I don't know, they could just go away. But well, I don't know about you guys. I talk to all of my decedents, whether they respond or not. I used to, and I just anymore. I think I just go into like my own. This is, I mean, you know, being in the and I'm not in a prep room very often anymore. But you know, when I still was, to me, it was kind of like quiet time, which is weird because it's not quiet in a prep room. 
but it was also like, nobody's talking, nobody, nobody's talking to me right now. Nobody's asking me anything. Nobody's like, you know, I can put on my music and I can do my thing and nobody is going to come and get me because they know it's a hassle to, that like, I'm not going to just stop, you know, kind of thing. So it was kind of like a hideout for me almost. So I didn't talk in the prep room much. I just kind of enjoyed the not having to talk for an hour, you know? Yeah. No, I, th I think it's great. And I think the show definitely gave a, um, gives a good representation of our restorative art abilities that people may not, I mean, mm -hmm. not everyone, I mean, obviously you're watching the show because you're interested in it, but I mean, to show people like, Hey, look, we're capable of, yeah. of something I think was amazing. And I think it does do a good job at the whole independent funeral home and some of the struggles that they face. It totally does. It does. There's some things too that are, that we get into where that like David says, or, or Nate says that are totally like, you would never say that in an arrangement. So it's, it's really interesting that way too, just kind of the, the things that they say that are just, you're just like, Oh no, you know what I mean? Um, but, but it was really, if you're into green stuff, that show was really kind of a, before it's time too, with all with like green burial and natural stuff because that wasn't yeah. a thing in the early two i mean it existed but the way that they portrayed it and how they worked it in there was really groundbreaking at the time and i realized they were in california maybe it wasn't so groundbreaking then but um that was probably the first time on a major television show that anything regarding regarding natural anything was shown to people you know it was yeah cool. and they definitely had a it is before it's time. And, you know, and that was, inter I, I find it interesting that where it was introduced from was Washington state where, you know, was brought down in the show, sure. which is right on cue because where's all the terramation taking place, mm -hmm. all the companies are Washington based. So it's, it really is, yeah. you know, a, uh, yeah. they, they, they had a good, cons whoever their consultant was, was amazing. They, they really oh, did, yeah. you know, and I mean, on that, on that topic of terramation too, for those that are interested in green and thing as well, um, you know, give a shout out that Terracon 2024, uh, the first annual Terramation body, you know, for those that don't know, it's body composting. Uh, their conference is taking place in Washington State, but there are also some uh, virtual attendance options as well. Um, and I'll put the link for that on our mortuarymayhem.com website for those that, because it is an eventbrite.com um, thing, so it'll be easier. I'll put a link there for those that want to click that. It's uh, Wednesday and Thursday, February 21st and February 22nd. So I'll put the link there for those that are interested in green. I think that's the thing is green services, terramation. I mean, this is really the, uh, the up and come. I mean, it's not new but it's really the up and coming it's it's, it's resurgence i mean natural burial is the og right i mean we put something in the ground or put them or cremate them before, like that's you know a green burial of in and of itself is not a new thing it's like the oldest time but it's like definitely having a, a resurgence in in a modern world which is important and that's why one of those reasons i say the students are living in such a cool time because um these things weren't happening 20 years ago. Maybe the the little undercurrent of it was, but it, not on the scale it is now. Um, and it's it's really cool to see and to, to be able to talk about in the schools and, and do all that. I'm going to be at Terracon in person um, doing, um, moderating the panel, which will be fun. I've never been to Seattle. Um, so that'll be fun. Um, but it's cool to be able to watch that all unfold and see how this had god dan i hope we don't make the same mistakes with this stuff as we made as an industry in so many other ways i've just gosh it's like one of these things that it's just staring us in the face like are you gonna fuck it all up again guys or are we gonna do this do this the right way and i i feel like so far so good but oh you know there are still so many funeral homes afraid of it I think a lot like anything. I mean, change. We it was it come back to the same topic. Change is hard, yep. but I think it's. I think as a bit. I'm. You know, I ran a business for many years. Um. So I. I mean, I get it. It's going to be really yeah. hard to put things in because if that family, it's awareness. But if that family yeah. comes in and talks to you, we can't be quick to say, okay, what do you want? And then they all of a sudden they say, oh, I want cremation. Oh, I want a burial because they somehow think that this is a one way or the other and yeah. or you know hey i want what what you did for grandpa um you do know grandpa was a atheist a pentecostal uh pick something and you know grandma is roman catholic yeah 
we may want to do something slightly different. And yeah. we respect that we can use the same casket. We can do all that. But, you know, as a funeral director, I always, anytime I've ever sat down with a family, I always said, have you put any consideration into what do you want? And they give me one option or the other. Okay, I want cremation. Let's, for example, because that's a way I can go. Well, that's not the end of the topic, conversation. Right? Yeah. Not the other conversation, right? Yep. So, and I think a lot of times we do, and I'm not saying every funeral home does this. They don't, but we do get a lot of people. I've sat in the other room and heard people do this where they just say, oh, cremation, okay. And it just goes direct. Yeah. And, and it's, instead, it's all of a sudden saying, okay, have you put any, now my next question, have you put any thought into are we going to have grandma in the front of a parlor in a casket? You don't have to pay for the casket. We have a special type of casket uh, for this purpose. Yeah. And then if they chose that, I'll go into the rental or versus, you yeah. know, crematable options. But we have a we have a ca an inexpensive casket option for this purpose. And then grandma's cremate, you know, we go to the church, the hearse drives off to go to the crematory, everyone else goes out to lunch, and we'll do the burial in another day. What, what's your options? No, 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 we just, you know, or do you want an urn up front? Nope, we want the urn up front. Perfect. Okay. So are we doing a service for the urn? Are we doing, there's yeah. so many options. We do it oh, already. Yeah, and most families do it. It's, it's, just, it's just as simple as they say, well, we want cremation. Great. You know, thanks for telling me that cremation is, is a very popular choice for disposition of, you know, the physical body, but has anybody ever taken the time to explain all the options around services with cremations? I, I find that most families are unaware of, of how many different options there are with cremation and, and just have those conversations. And, you know, same thing with, with, with uh, body compost or water cremation. It's something, it's what happens to the body, but what happens before that is wide open. And I don't know why funeral directors, they just tunnel vision that, or why are we doing that? You know what I mean? We we already have, should be able to, to deal with it, the public going, well, cremation just means they're cremated. What do you mean there's other things we can do? And we do it ourselves. And it's like, okay, why are we afraid of water cremation? All it is is a different, it's a different machine we put them in. Everything else that happens before is the same, can be, you know, composting. You know, some things have to be different because of the science involved there, but there's still all these options that can happen before that. And, and if we're not, we, we should never be afraid of losing business or losing money or losing whatever it is we're afraid of because of what happens to the physical body because that's a very minor part of what, what we do as professionals, what we do in the funeral service business, that what physically happens to the dead body is like that much of it. But we're the ones that make it mean this much and it makes me crazy. I don't know why right. we do it. I mean, it's definitely advantageous. And I think the other thing too, is it's, there's so many things we can provide, obviously more than yeah. just an urn, but um, you know, or keepsakes and all these other things that we do, but I think it's so it's so advantageous to have that material available to a family and just say, have you considered your options? There's other options available that yes. I'm not going to tell, you know, I'm just going to put these in front of you if you're interested. If not, I'll put them back in the rack. That's that's awesome. We'll give them to the next family. But I think it's there is value to doing that. And again, I am I am in Massachusetts uh, in every state being different where for those that don't know, Massachusetts law does not allow a funeral director to be involved in anything but that funeral home. I can't have any interest in a flower shop, a cemetery, a cremate, a crematory, anything versus, I mean, we already have funeral homes here that are fighting for, you know, to even have cremation. They're like, hey, I already have the gas lines in my garage. I'm ready to go. As soon as they pass it, I'll be the first one to do it. And, you know, some states allow that, but I think that's that's always a barrier, you know, too, yeah. is. Oh, the yeah, funeral definitely. Home, what's their buy-in? What are they getting out of it? Or are they going to get the same thing if they just do what they've always done? You know, so. Yeah. And there's parts of the country that'll never be interested in that. And, but there's always that one or one or two families, you know, don't, don't write, don't think that just because most of your families go to, go to Catholic church and go to the national cemetery means that you won't get to some that aren't, that want something different. And you just got to be able to I'm not saying you got to have a, a water cremation unit and a cream and a retort and a, and a com. You don't have to have all those things. You just have to be open to it. And if a family wants to use you as their service provider, you know, be able to, to help facilitate those things for them. That's it. I mean, if I opened a funeral home, I wouldn't own my own cremator. I wouldn't do that for, if I ever did for years and years because, you know, it costs a lot of money. But if somebody wanted to, to, compost somebody i know who to call to make that happen i can still be their funeral director in, in their funeral home and you just do those things you know as as trade the couple times a year that you have to 
you know, have to do them, but don't be afraid of it. Don't, I just, I really, really, what, what I really hope I don't hear is that funeral homes are going, oh no, we don't do that. Right. It's, it's an option, especially if you're doing third party, because totally. either I, I either bring you to a, you know, cemetery, if you're being buried in a casket or bring you to a memorial garden or crematory, yeah. or I bring either way, I have to bring you somewhere. And I think as a business, obviously, it's going to be very hard for the termination companies to make it into areas until they have enough people interested. Sure. So we need the people interested. If you're interested, yeah. make it vocal that you're interested. And then now these companies are willing to, you know, franchise yeah. into your area. Yeah. Okay, before we keep going, run, fly. Okay, all right, bye. Good to see you guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mortuary Mayhem. For links to information discussed during this episode, please visit the website at www.mortuarymayhem.com. Do you have questions, comments, suggestions for topics, or want to be a guest on the show? Email us at podcast at mortuarymayhem.com. We should do this again sometime.